Well, hello, good to see you. I'm so glad you could be here. Welcome to the first studio session of Upload VR's Winter Wrap-Up Week. I am Jamie. Uh, the Winter Wrap-Up is going on all week. We are rounding up some of the best news from the last uh, 12 months of VR. We're going to be looking forward to some of the games coming next year. And we've got some really, really cool exclusive game reveals coming. So if you were here earlier today, you would have seen... I hope this is going out at the right time because it's kind of a mystery. But uh, you would have seen the first gameplay of Wizards Dark Times on Quest. And coming up at 9 a.m. PT for the rest of the week, we're going to have new reveals, new cool stuff coming up that you're really going to enjoy. So stick with us. But right now, today, we are talking the biggest VR headlines of the year. And to, to go through it, to sift through the menagerie of headlines i have with me the one the only ian hamilton hello everyone thank you for joining us it's been a big year hasn't it jamie yeah it's been a i mean it's it's funny like last night the uh we're recording this on a friday and last night there were the game awards and there was a disney investors meeting and i heard the phrase it's been a tough year maybe about a hundred times last night <laughs> people just said it yeah. over and over and over again but I mean, we're, you know, working in VR, we're in a, a strange industry to react to this pandemic. And that's, that's going to come up in the headlines that we're talking about. Obviously, the whole, I, the whole promise of VR was that one day we would be connecting and, 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 you know, joining up with people around the world as if instead of taking 12 hour flights to get there, we were sitting right next to each other uh, as me and Ian are right now. Um, yeah. So last time, last time our, we saw each other, uh, last time an Upload VR staff member like saw each other for work was, January and the only time we've actually gotten mm. to spend like quality time together has been in the studio and it's been honestly a, essential to my year like this it's been a it's hopefully it's on your calendars too but it's on my calendar of getting to see you and all the other staffers in in this studio yeah for sure and I, I'm glad you said that because we were going to start talking about one subject but I'm gonna because we're we're here right now let's let's go into COVID in general and the impact had on vr uh this year because covid and vr have had this kind of weird strange relationship this pandemic has had a very very strange relationship um there's there's different facets to look at i mean at the start of lockdowns earlier in the year half-life alex was just coming out so it seemed like a very promising thing to buy a vr headset and keep yourself entertained during lockdown but there were stock shortages right i mean uh valve had ongoing stock problems with the the index that have you know really continued throughout the year and facebook was having problems with the original oculus quest as well which i think you know for people that work and love the industry uh, and want to see it you know eventually grow in the right ways was kind of frus frustrating to see right i wanted everyone to be able to pick up a quest at the start of the year and they just weren't able to yeah, that led to a lot of conversation there early on of just this should be VR's moment and it isn't, and there therefore mm -hmm. VR is dead. That was that was a lot of the early discussion, and it was pretty stupid because people people were mad that they're now working from home, so they're coming up with some hot takes as soon as they're back on their home computer typing things out. Where's my VR headset? <laughs> you know, right? Um, well, you can't order it because they're all sold out. Everyone bought them. You don't have a store to go get them from mm -hmm. because you can't go in the store. And so, like, it was, it was invisible to these people that uh, this was the year VR took off. And honestly, I think it had nothing to do with the pan pandemic. It just... Timing. Yeah. So it synced up. It, it was... The Quest 2 is the right device at the right time. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, there was... <clears throat> You're right in that there were going to be shortages of Quest anyway, it seemed right. Like, that, it was just the way it was going. The thing was selling... What we were told was selling very, very well. And I think Index was having... I, I can't remember a time that Index was in stock, to be fair. <laughs> so I'll give that one to you. Um, one, of, one of the interesting things, I think, as well, though, is there's two sides to what the pandemic has done for VR software and VR businesses. And I, the, the harder, harsher and harder sides of... Uh, sorry. The harder and harsher side of this right now is what it's done to the fledgling and very promising VR arcade industry and uh, companies like The Void um, that were making really, really promising, very, very, very immersive stuff that have essentially now had to like sit 2020 out, right? And many of them couldn't afford to sit 2020 out, which I, yeah. it's, it's just very, very tragic and hard to see, especially 
I know you're a big fan of the void um, and we don't know what, what future they're going to have, if any, coming back, you know, as we move hopefully back into a sort of new normal later on in 2021. I really, I really would not be surprised to see uh, several of these companies emerge as one company on the other side of this. Like that's, that's kind of the mm. inevitable thing that would make sense to me is just to combine and but even then none of these companies had a ton of traction to begin with so there's not a lot of value in what is left to, to, to combine um mm. I, you know i think the it's it was so weird to kind of see these businesses try so hard i remember right when the pandemic first started i remember the two-bit circus down in los angeles and it was like every the, the the things these businesses were trying to do were changing on a day to day basis. And the morning of one day, Two Bit Circus said, "We're going to put infrared cameras at the entrance to our building so that we can check the temperature of people before they come in and confirm that they don't have an active fever, uh, which is one of obviously one of the key uh, traits of COVID." Um, so. Then the next day they were shut down completely, right? Because of health orders. Yeah. And so like, it was very weird to see these companies kind of reacting in um, real time to this thing. And I just, I just uh, relocated across the country and found uh, their ad, <laughs> where I'm at now, there are a handful of intensive care beds available for patients with COVID uh you know very serious symptoms who who need help and there's not many beds here in this part of the country right now for those people and i saw an ad on tv for an adventure park that features new vr headsets mm. in there and in, as part of the advertisement they said we're installing new sanitation techniques and it shows these two kids with masks on and then their vr headsets right above their masks and i'm just you know, shaking my head, thinking, how how do you put these two realities together in the same place? Like you as a business, I understand you need to survive, but your customers need to survive too. And uh, mm -hmm. it's it was a very hard thing to see kind of everyone react differently all at once to this. But what I think it's settling in now is just how essential VR can be to the discussion. I think of another company, Cloudhead. They are very particular yep. about having a physical office. And one of the things they have started developing by the end of this year was a remote work solution that wasn't as bad as Zoom okay. and wasn't necessarily all in on VR. Like you didn't, you don't have to put on a headset to join Cloudhead's experimental social software. Uh, they've got big TV heads. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, mm. yeah, they've got, you've got a big TV head and you actually show your webcam view of the person outside VR on the big TV head and to their point, and there's another one just announced gel app. Uh, so there's several, uh, more than several solutions to try to get this remote work solution. There was spaces that got bought up by Apple, uh, in, by the middle of the year. So there's been very subtle, slow under you know, under the radar changes that are sort of like, if the if if this pandemic goes somehow for two more years, if like the vaccines fail or something like that happens, there's a lot of companies out there that are really reacting to this new reality in a very serious way. And Cloudhead is an mm. example, and there's the and the the biggies are getting there too. I think about that stock shortage and. You know, there's not a exactly a stock shortage now of quests. I mean, there is, but that's because demand is so high. It's not like they, not like it was earlier in the year where they wonder they might have wondered whether they could even get a new headset out by the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, they were they were definitely more ready than you know Sony and and Microsoft. It seems in terms of distributing uh, the quests. I'm sure the demands are are very very different, but. Um, they definitely seemed more ready than anyone else. I, I'm glad you brought up the, the social platforms because I think something about the pandemic um, has been really driving home the other kind of experiences that VR can give you outside of gaming. And it has been a very interesting time in terms of that stuff because people have really come to VR as a source of exercise, for example. And, um, you know, a lot of the time they're still using the same apps. They're using Beat Saber 
more often than not because that is just such a fun engaging addictive way to kill time and also find out that you know you're you're losing weight playing it enough um and then we also saw you know some more ambitious attempts we saw supernatural launch earlier this year which is very very ambitious kind of beat saber clone that that was exercise focused but charged i think it was 20 dollars a month um and we've seen some really really cool experiments with hand tracking uh we've seen more kind of vr movie stuff come along as you said there's lots more social stuff i kind of feel like in some ways the pandemic you know sort of a silver lining way for vr pushed people to think about what you can do with vr um and and it's you know it, it's importance in the future and take that a bit more seriously than the gaming platform it's been primarily built as so far there there was that chart that i remember earlier in the year that people were sharing and it shows uh two people not wearing masks and it gives your COVID risk, you know, your transmission risk. If one of you has it versus, you know, how likely it is just to be passed that way. And then you go down and you have one person wearing a mask and the percentage of, of the other person getting infected goes down. And then you have both people wearing a mask and it's mm. very slim once, mo once both people are wearing a mask. And then you put right below that two people in VR headsets actually talking to each other. And that's zero risk. And where can you say that? I mean, yeah. there's there's millions and millions and millions of people i mean it's got to be in the billions uh actually of people who have been afraid to go out of their house this year and that's astonishing mm. change to like human life <laughs> um that people weren't really expecting they don't want um and they're adapting like i i remember early in this year i I really wanted to reduce our screen time, right? I, I wanted to manage it because I knew we would be standing in front of the screen. But by the end of it, like, the reality is this, the, the headset ended up being really essential to socialization over the mm. course of the year. Mm. Yeah, and I, I guess I wonder then, you know, what do we take from it moving, you know, hopefully moving out of the pandemic in the next six months? I know something that you and me have talked about quite a lot is the idea of the return of events like GDC and E3 and how, you know, on a, on a more negative front, that's really going to change the way you look at going to any old conference and putting something on your head, right? I think all of us have been through a massive kind of shock about that. I will be certainly very, very uh, reserved about going to do it again anytime soon. Um, but the, I mean, there's going to be a lot of different changes, right? I, I think, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I I doubt I'm going to go anywhere in my life without a mask from here on out. I think it's mm -hmm. just going to be I'm not not that I'm going to wear it, but I think it'll be in my pocket even if I'm perfectly healthy and there's no pandemic. I think there's enough mm -hmm. reason and evidence to suggest that it is a <laughs> it's a help uh and will keep you from being sick more often. And just thinking about that's me, right? You could be completely different. Everyone out there is completely different in how they're going to think about what they're going to do after this. But my point is that the behaviors in subtle ways are changing across the board. And I don't know if I'm going to be comfortable going to avoid again and sharing somebody else's headset. Mm. I just, yeah, if everyone's vaccinated, I still won't feel comfortable putting on other headsets. And there's going to still be, need to be innovation there to get people I, I still want to be your bring your own vr place that, that this yeah. was kind of I, I talked with some people out there during the early parts of this pandemic and there's a model for something that's very similar to a bowling alley where you can rent out equipment if you want or you can bring your own equipment and have a great experience that you can't have at home mm. and a bowling alley is a great example of that because who has a hundred yards or whatever the length of a bowling alley is, plus a machine to put in new pins. Like that's something you cannot do at home. And so you go to a destination to do it. Well, VR can VR has content that is built for those opportunities, but they don't have necessarily great wireless systems to use with those yet. And then there's no there's no example of this model built yet where if you don't want to wear somebody's headset, somebody else's headset on your face, you could just bring your own. Yeah, there's the, I mean, there's lots to be done on that front. And I definitely think, you know, 
I'm going to be really interested to see going forward what this does for VR software, how, how seriously people take indoor VR exercise, how seriously people take, you know, the launch of Facebook's new social platforms and things like that. Because I think, you know, as we were saying earlier, the pandemic has put a lot of those in context in very, very interesting ways. Um, moving on to the, to the next subject then, which was initially going to be our first subject. I want to talk about the thing that's really kind of dominated so much of the year, which is, which is Facebook's activity in VR this year. I mean, Facebook is still easily, from a publicity point of view, the most active uh, member of the VR industry. They, you know, Oculus is still a huge, huge driving force in the industry. Uh, it's got competition from Sony. It's got competition from Valve. But these organizations, even something like Sony, isn't something that can really keep pace with the scale of, of uh, Facebook's operations in VR. And the big story, I think, that then kind of like bleeds out into all these other subjects uh, for the year with Facebook is Facebook launching account requirement for Oculus headsets, Oculus accounts, uh, which came into effect in uh, October of this year uh, as the Quest 2 was launching. I believe they announced it in August. Um, and, and I think this is such a complex topic because when it was first announced, even though it kind of hadn't been, Facebook had been very coy on ever saying that this would happen. And, and you know, in, in, in the past, past members of Oculus and, and co have said, yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, it also kind of seemed like a no brainer that they would one day want to use this giant platform that they're building to bring people onto, you know, their original platform. Um, but I think even in the space of the few months since it's been announced and the fewer months since it's been implemented, we've seen unexpected fallout. So when we first saw this was coming, we were, I remember us discussing it. It was kind of like an obvious, we knew it was going to happen. We, mm -hmm. we, or we expected it to happen, just a question of when. And mm -hmm. it, this, is, this was true going back years into my coverage and talking to the people at Oculus. And the Oculus people, you know, I think they got assurances or they thought it wasn't going to happen, at least under their watch. There wasn't like a, a, a reality check that you're not going to be around there forever. You know, like you, it's, there's people above your pay grade who are going to make that call. And that's essentially what it seems has happened is someone at the executive level at Facebook said, we need this to happen for whatever reason. And we've had theories, we've been floating theories and trying to get one of the theories out there is, is this latest fallout, which is that the FTC and a lot of states are suing Facebook over what is being called anti-competitive practices. You know, there's, uh, they mm. purchased Instagram, they purchased WhatsApp for, it's, Instagram was $1 billion, I think, back in the day, which makes it seem like the most absurd bargain yeah. in the world at this point. And then WhatsApp <laughs> was something like $19 billion, if I recall. So, like, in between those two purchases, I think, was Oculus at $2 billion. And Oculus isn't mentioned in a lot of this anti-competitive stuff. Uh, it's, it's, it's mentioned separately. It's just not in, it, the focus of the main lawsuit against Facebook appears to be those two big, massive social networking acquisitions. The issue where we get to with, with Facebook and the way, the way regulators and governments might start to look at this is what's happening in Germany. So uh, Oculus Quest is not for sale in Germany right now. The Oculus Quest 2 is not for sale. And the regulators there have pointed out that the reason it's not for sale or, or one of the problems is that it's tying your Facebook account to something else. And I think, you know, as journalists, we try to be as neutral as possible, as often as possible. And on presenting news like this, we are trying to be as objective as we can in just presenting the facts. But there's something I think that happened in this process, which kind of got glossed over or steamrolled. And that's this could have been an optional thing for a lot longer. They could have made Facebook accounts mm. way more prominent and, and prompted you to sign up for a Facebook account in order to use your headset and given you a lot of the benefits of signing up for a Facebook account. But they could have kept it just like they had for the couple, last couple of years, where if you really wanted to, you can click, up, click past all that and go sign up for an Oculus account 
and and use your headset with limited services. If they really wanted you to, you know, they could give Oculus headsets with limited social services. And it, and it is just what you're talking about when you say limited services. You are literally just talking about, oh, I want to share a screenshot of the game. And yeah, okay, fine. If you don't have your Facebook account, you won't be able to upload it to that wall and whatnot, right? Which I think it would be an acceptable trade-off for sure. I th- I, it's, it's really interesting because they announced this, uh, this switch was coming uh, like a month or two before the Quest 2 was coming. And I guess in many ways that signaled First of all, that this headset was coming, and second of all, their confidence in how popular it was going to be, right? Mm-hmm. That they didn't want to, in their mind, they didn't want to muddy the water of when they first brought this thing in that, could, that they thought could be VR's iPhone moment, for lack of a better term. And they, they wanted that kind of hard cut, and they were willing to take the hit that, at the end of the day, was a huge, huge internet controversy, but... You know, they did their sums as Facebook always do, and they knew they were going to take that hit and they'd be fine for it. And it seems like, you know, so far, it seems like the Quest 2 is doing very, very well. Yeah, there's people alone in their houses all year long, and they feel managed by two groups. They feel managed by their government and they feel managed by Facebook, honestly. Their corporations in their life, mm. right? The, 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 the things that are delivering them uh, packages to their front door. And that's like, it, it's, it's easy when you you know it's it's easy to kind of mix up the role of government and the role that facebook has in your life because they're so influential Mm. one of the products facebook announced this year was facebook dating i think i think it was this year or maybe it was last year um but face i think it was last year but it it was recent. yeah so they've got facebook dating now and so like the idea is you can (laughs) your whole life including everything terrible that happens gets stored inside facebook and I think Facebook is transitioning to a a reality where they want to reshape the whole world in their image. Mm. And that's what we saw in part of our reporting this year is some of their long-term AR technologies will involve super hearing and super sight and what will happen to society when there's a lot of people walking around who have those sorts of things attached to their body. And so, like, I think, I think it's a very serious question that people need to be thinking about heading into 2021 and beyond of just, do you want Facebook reshaping the world in its image? And that's, that's the path they're on. Make no mistake. It's absolutely the path they're on because VR leads to AR. And as soon as AR is a real product out in the real world, it's going to change social norms. People are going to think twice about what they say in a diner because there could be a person Mm. sitting three tables away with augmented hearing and able to hear it over there. And it's like, those are the questions Facebook's teams are thinking through right now. They're literally trying to think, what's the right way to implement this technology? What are the right protocols? What are the right safety parameters we need make sure people aren't creeped out everywhere they go (laughs) um and that's what apple and the others are doing too but it's just it's very important to recognize that this facebook requirement is one step on this very long path for facebook that's such a great way to to summarize it all because it is very much about tracing it forward right like right now yeah gaming is the primary focus of vr and so it's very easy to look at the the topic of of this facebook account requirement and say well if it gets me medal of honor and if it gets me you know missed and and all these great exclusive games that facebook is investing in i don't mind at all and i'm going to keep on living my life but you are absolutely right that you know facebook is not a gaming company at heart they did not buy oculus so they could compete with playstation and microsoft in in comparatively smaller markets for what VR could grow out to be at the end of the day. You know, gaming right now reaches per company maybe 100 million people by the end of a console generation cycle. That's not what Facebook is interested in. They're not interested in 100 million. They're interested in 100 billion. And this all traces out to what Ian is saying. So I think that's a really, really good point. And I think it's 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 well worth bearing in mind as we as we continue to follow Quest 2 uh, into 2021. It's definitely going to be 
something that guides all of our reporting, like Ian says, and, and, and something that everyone at home should be thinking about too. Um, I want to move on from all of that because it's, it's, it's a very complex topic and we've, we've got plenty of coverage. I, we've, got, we've got some really great conversations. I implore you to go back and watch some of our old download podcasts with people like uh, with Kent By and people like that. We've got some really fantastic conversations about it. You mentioned Apple. Yeah. And I, I want to talk, you know, I just, I just want to touch on Apple more than anything because it's just such a watched company and we've, the, all we have to go on as usual this year with Apple and VR and AR is rumors, but there does seem to be this one very, very much anticipated rumor that they could be doing some standalone VR in 2022 and then continuing uh, fractured reports about what they're doing in the AR space, right? What do you, what do you make of what we've heard uh, from Apple this year in, in spatial computing? So Apple seems to be the sh- one of the shrewdest companies on the, on, on the planet about making tough decisions about killing products. So they will not mm. release a product until they think they've got it right. And, and, and that means price, that means apps, and that means everything. That means the whole package is there. And that makes it very hard to predict when they're going to finally get in, when they're finally going to say it's good enough. And one of the technologies Apple rolled out this year was LiDAR on their iPads and their iPhones. So I got one of the LiDAR-powered iPads early in the year, and I did nothing with it except normal iPad things mm. for six months. There, there were apps out there that, tried to support the LiDAR in the iPad, but they took most of the year to get good enough to actually be useful. And so now by the end of the year, we've got iPhones and iPads that can scan your entire environment in 3D and produce for you a 3D model that you can upload to anywhere and have it then be relayed to the, to the globe. So you could take a scan of, of uh, your dinner table at Thanksgiving and send that off to a family uh, and they could pull it up on their phones or devices and look really closely at everything on your table. Um, the, you can also place that same object, the same 3D object on the floor and walk around it with your device and look at it there. None of that really is as compelling as putting on the glasses and putting on a real pair of glasses and seeing these things presented in front of you or, or a headset in the case yeah. of a VR device that can actually get you a proper field of view. So one of the theories that was floated earlier this year was that the LiDAR sensor might be key to enabling low, might be key to privacy in AR. So one of the issues with the Oculus Quest, the the things that make people uncomfortable, is it's got a white light up here and four cameras that are looking around. So anytime the white light is on, those four cameras are active in scanning the room for features, looking around the room for features, so it can tell the headset where you are in the room. That's how tracking works. What makes people incredibly uncomfortable, and we've put it in our reporting, is that their cameras, right? Uh, the very first portal device that came out had a physical cover that you could slide over the lens so that you could just go to sleep knowing that there isn't a Facebook camera in your room staring at you at all hours like like a Lord of the Rings, uh, whatever that thing is called, Palantir? <laughs> is that what it is? Um, yeah, it's something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, they, they physically have this cover. There's no physical cover uh, for the Oculus Quest lenses. The way they have it is this light on the thing. And the idea is that maybe LiDAR could allow it to be less... Allow a system to capture less data about its environment. Just the, just the like actual structure of the environment, not its textures. And if you can think of a of like a a depth sensing technology that doesn't see textures, maybe people would feel more comfortable with not having a light on those devices. Maybe people could have like a slim pair of sunglasses that are scanning the environment at all times, but not actually capturing peop- uh, the texture of people's faces, just the shape. Now, I'm, su- I'm sure mm. there's technologies to infer a lot of those things and still work, but it's, the point is that at, at the like chip layer, 
maybe they could capture less data. And Facebook is, we've got articles about this on uploadvr.com. Facebook is pretty clear about how they collect data, or at least they've, they've got explanations about how they collect data and what they do with those, what those camera sensors do. Yeah, Facebook tries to be clear about what they do with that data. And they say that the sensors sort of destroy the visual data as soon as they're captured. It's like never stored anywhere, according to Facebook. What they care about is the points around you and your relation to them. And it's just the thing is people would feel more comfortable if there was less data even than that. And mm -hmm. I think that LiDAR is it, one of the theories that was floated this year is that LiDAR could be a path to that. So do you think it's like kind of really important that Apple gets out ahead with that tech and sets a kind of precedent that ultimately something like Facebook might have to follow? Or do you yeah. think these are going to be two very different approaches that persist? Um, I think it's interesting the kind of game Apple could play at this point because if there's a race on right now to do the AR glasses and we don't know whether they get compelling in 2023 or 2030 mm. or 2040 for that matter, honestly, because of the, the issues that they have to solve in order to make compelling all day AR glasses. But consider like different situations where like maybe Facebook doesn't take the care that Apple's doing and trying to, to solve this. You know, maybe Facebook does the light thing. Maybe other competitors do mm. the light thing. And then as soon as they commit to that hardware, Apple could come out and say, you know, actually, these aren't going to need a light on them. They're not going to be that creepy. They're going to be very slim. And uh, yeah, you'll get great functionality, but you're going to get all of the full branded privacy features you know and love. That's, that's the way they'll pitch it. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is if they can differentiate along the lines of then Facebook's in trouble and Google's in trouble in a very, very big way. So short term then, I mean, you, you, you say that you don't know how, how quickly this stuff is going to roll out because like you said, there's, there's a heck of a lot of problems there. I find uh, just from a you know, very basic consumer standpoint, I find the idea of a Apple VR headset, a standalone Quest competitor, I find that quite strange because for the longest time, I believe that Apple wouldn't do that and wouldn't have interest in that. And you, and you can say, well, you know, so much of the technology that is in VR is one day going to lead to AR, as we've discussed earlier. So, of course, they would have interest in that. I'm very interested in what, you know, if the rumor of a standalone Quest competitor in 2022 was true, what that would end up looking like. And, and, and not just from a hardware perspective, because, you know, they do sleek hardware and it's incredible, but from an ecosystem and, and you know, content perspective, because you know, Quest, again, I'm saying it again, is billed as a gaming device first and foremost, but Apple has always kind of had this strange relationship with gaming first and foremost, whether it's on Mac or iPhone but then, or, or uh, iPad. But more prominently talking about the iPhone is it, it's always been, those press conferences have always been built around, look at all these useful features this thing has, this garage band app, this... Uh, AR measurement app, you know, note taking, all those kinds of things. Is Apple going to come out with something in 2022 that is a Quest competitor that's not built around gaming, that is saying, look at all the wonderful uses VR can have in your well, life. So here is Apple Gym. Here is yep. App Apple Office. Apple Gym. Right there, Ooh, right? Apple Gym is a good name. You just came off of that? Did you just you came up that that with that off the top of your head? I, did, I just did. That's, I just did. Just I'm joining I just haven't told he's you. Getting, he's been hired by Apple. He's going to tell us. He's putting in his two <laughs> weeks' notice. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I think that's exactly where Apple's going to be focused. And I think that's exactly all these demos. You know, it takes. There's lots of people who got into VR early and saw a Gear VR or a Go or a DK2, and it just wasn't compelling enough. They, they sat in front of mm. it for two hours or whatever and said, huh, that's interesting. Not right now. And I think yeah. that was a really logical choice for anyone who did that sort of, you know, assessment back in the time, back, back in the day. But I, I think Tim Cook himself, the CEO of App, could have been one of those people. 
he I think he could have had mm. teams go and build something hardware wise, and he put it on. He's like, yeah, it's okay. It's not it's not big enough for Apple. But what I'm wondering is if you put yeah. a Quest Two on him and gave him Supernatural or Beat Saber or Pistol Whip or the the five other exercise games that are all on Quest. Would he come around and would he realize, okay, we need to build a headset that doesn't absorb sweat, that's easily changeable between people? You know, and I go down the list, that's secure and privacy oriented and doesn't have to have a light on it all the time anytime it's, it's sensing where it is. Those are the types of things that like, as soon as Apple realizes, you know, we could actually make people healthier with this thing, then you've got a product focus. And I think that would be Apple's product focus if they actually you know, pulled the trigger. Someone that is not going to move their VR focus away from gaming anytime soon is definitely Sony, mm. um, who came out at the start of the year uh, announcing, obviously, that they were going to be bringing out PS5, which is now out. Um, back at CES, I remember in January, Jim Ryan revealing the logo for the PS5 and at the same time announcing uh, PSVR has sold 5 million units to date. Now, that was all the way back at the start of the year, and we actually haven't heard another update since then. And traditionally, Sony has given two or three updates on their sales figures throughout the year. So it's possible now that they could be 6 million, maybe maybe 7 million, or I don't know. The, the, the product is towards the tail end of its life cycle, and it's a very interesting time right now in the PlayStation VR space because we are all left asking what's next, right? We have the PlayStation 5 out now. We've done a lot of reporting in the last couple of weeks about what the future of the platform will be there. Are, are they going to go with a full-fledged high-end PSVR 2? Is Quest 2 making them maybe rethink their strategy? It, it, do you think 5 million units is enough for Sony to say, let's make PSVR 2 for sure? Do you think 5 million... PSVR sold guarantees PSVR two. Uh, oh, what a good. So you asked two different questions. The second one was 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 harder. Um, okay. I think I, I, I the question boils down to standalone or it requires a box nearby. Mm -hmm. And I, I think at some point, very quickly, uh, five million should be eclipsed by Quest two. Um. Yep. And that should paint a pretty clear picture to Sony of where where the money is to be made. Um, you know, I want a, a standalone headset that got super powered by a PS5 sounds like a pretty amazing proposition. And I would be very, very, very interested in seeing that. I'm glad you've said all that because it's just reminded me of a quote from the former PlayStation CEO, Andrew House, a couple of years ago, which was something to the tune of, we're actually not that pleased with the fact that we are so easily the market leader now, which was a quote that basically communicated, well, we haven't really sold that much, and yet we still seem to be so far ahead of the game. A little bit worrying. So, I mean, for them, you're right. I think, I think they can come out and look at Quest 2 and actually, like you said, see opportunity, market opportunity there, and say, oh, okay, maybe we can take this back to the drawing board. Maybe we can have a standalone PlayStation VR that maybe has access to the existing PSVR library. That could be really, really powerful. But then, like you said, like Quest 2 is a great, great device. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to link that to a PC going forward, maybe wirelessly, hopefully one day, to play really cool, high-power games. But what Sony has over these, these companies, at least in the short term, is that expertise in ecosystem and software library. So... PlayStation is going to be the only place that at some point that you're going to be able to play like the next Gran Turismo 7 in VR. And that's, that's big going, going into the future for the next couple of years, I believe. And that's, that's why I believe, you know, there is still a future for Sony and VR because those games are going to be such huge, huge drivers, I believe, literally with Gran Turismo 7 and, you know, potentially a Resident Evil 8 um, and the work they've done with Sony London uh, at Blood and, the Blood and Truth guys there. They, they've built up this really incredible stable of games already. I still intend that I think PSVR probably has the best software library of any of them uh, right now. So I, I guess it's a hard one to tell because recent quotes from current CEO uh, Jim Ryan said, you know, we're more than a minute away from the future of VR, um, which 
didn't inspire a lot of confidence. But, you know, maybe they're looking at Quest 2 and saying, okay, yeah, there is something there. Maybe we just need to take a little longer to get there. And then to your point, maybe the PS5 is like a secret weapon in all of that as well. We'll see what's going on. Uh, 2021 is definitely going to be a very uh, interesting year for PlayStation. Um, hopeful to see developments, but won't hold my breath. Um, some, some people that it's probably going to be a very good year for, 2021, are the VR developers that have been acquired this year. And there are a surprisingly large amount of them um, if you look back throughout the year. So starting out, we have Facebook, which has... On top of buying Beat Games at the end of 2019, the developers of Beat Saber, earlier this year they made moves to buy Ready at Dawn and Sanzaru Games. So that's the developer of Echo VR and Lone Echo and the developer of Asgard's Ref and the recently shut down Hovel's Powers United VR, but don't worry about that one. Um, just a couple of months ago, Koch Media, a, a very big video game publisher that has lots of confusing ties to lots of other games, bought... Vertigo Games, uh, the makers of Arizona Sunshine, the publisher of Fisherman's Tale, of Traffic Jams, uh, just announced they are publishing Unplugged and are working on After the Fall for next year. And then a, a, a kind of Nordic uh, collective of developers announced they are purchasing CodeSync, which is behind the upcoming Jurassic World video game. They've done some publishing stuff themselves. They published uh, the most recent version of Onward on Quest. Uh, broke into the VR scene with uh, Esper on GVR a long time ago. I would say it's been an encouraging year in, in terms of people potentially waking up to the opportunity of VR in the next couple of years now, probably driven by Quest 2, like we've talked about before. I, I have a bit of deja vu, I don't know about you, where you know we, we, we were seeing plenty of these types of headlines back in like 2014, 2015, and then we had this kind of difficult time where it all went away because all we had was PC VR and it was just such a non-starter in terms of commercial viability. Uh, and now it seems like the acquisitions and the investments are back and maybe they're here to stay this time. Yeah, I think, I think we're due for bigger ones after some of the dust settles with the antitrust investigations. When, when whatever the course that's on becomes clear to the companies involved, so uh, if Google thinks it's got its legislate, you know, its its legal situation handled, and if uh, Facebook thinks it's got its legal situation handled, I think a buying spree is very likely uh, of a very big companies. You look at a company like Horizon, or not a company. Uh, when you look at Horizon, Facebook Horizon, you see them reinventing the wheel, so to speak. When they've mm -hmm. already got VR Chat and Rec Room doing a great job with the same things. And the only explanation I can think of for why Facebook is trying to do that themselves is they're trying to build up a muscle that they don't have, and that's building that themselves <laughs> um, instead of acquiring someone else and integrating that yeah. into the larger organization. And it, that, the one obvious reason for why they would do that is because it would just give more, if they went out and acquired Rec Room or VR Chat for however many billions of dollars, that they that those companies think they're worth that's just letting more fuel to the fire that they need to be broken up and they're they're not playing fair um so i think it's i think we're due for a lot more of these types of gigantic acquisitions the one the one i think facebook needs to solve is they need to have a game engine um we've been talking about that with yep. heaney and they they've been after it for years. We've got reports that they had they they went after Unity at least once, maybe more times. Epic seems to be on its own path uh, with Unreal Engine, so there's not a ton of options. There's I think Crytek out there, um, but it's you know that's the type of tool set Facebook needs to build. You know, give something to other people that they're going to want to build with themselves. And Facebook Horizon has some really interesting parts to it but i wasn't compelled to go back you know it wasn't one of those things where i did five things in a row that were really fun and really wanted to go back it was like ah, oh, okay interesting audio here sounds cool and then i just haven't seen a reason to go back so <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of yeah. improvement to do in that particular social network and the easiest way that facebook knows how to do that is to acquire somebody to make it better 
Um, they've had a lot of years to get this right. They could have a lot of things behind closed doors, too, that they've been working on that they just haven't released to the public yet. Mm. And, and there's, of course, yeah, what's, Val, that's what's interesting. going to do, right? What was the last acquisition Valve made? I feel they made, uh, uh, they, they bought a developer. I can't remember the name of the developer right now, but they ended up working on uh, canceling whatever game they were originally working on and, and coming over that's to Campo? Campo? Alex, right? Yeah, yeah, Santo Campo, that's it. You're right. They made Firewatch, yeah. So, you know, that, that was a team they clearly identified as potentially having great storytelling uh, potential in VR and, and decided was worth making that investment in. They've also, like you say, they've also got their like hardware teams to think about as well. I think what I'd like to see from the uh, from the kind of acquisition and investment side going forward is, you know, bring it, bringing it back to Sony personally for me because they've recently made moves that aren't that so, encouraging on that front. They they they, they shut down a, a studio in the UK. Sorry. No, so one one theory I had, or one one thing that would be cool is the PC market needs two things. It needs to be a wireless PVR beast, and it needs to be inexpensive. If those two things are solved mm. for the PC itself, you have a reason for people to go out and buy PCs just for VR. Um, without those things, Valve has a really tough time doing, you know, making progress, pushing back against Facebook and these others. Um, the other thing that Valve and the PC market is missing is a publisher. Is like someone to just fund yeah. great VR titles that are made for PC, and I, I'm not—I don't want to say Valve isn't going to do those two things, but those are the two things that, if you wanted to push back at at Facebook and anyone else, you could do to like really reinvigorate the PC VR market and give it a chance to to grow in the future and. Um, you know, give a real choice to people between PC VR and Quest. Because right now, wired PC VR is not is not the same proposition as wireless Quest. And mm. it's like it's it's just it's the wireless Quest is such a great proposition at such a, a an absurd price at three hundred dollars that the PC VR just has no no defender, no like champion, and. Until the until that exists for PC VR, we're going to be keep talking about these consoles and uh, what platforms these companies want to build that are larger than just the PC market. And I just I mm. I, I don't I, people want Valve to be this hero of VR, and I don't think that's what Valve is. Um, they're a company very interested in increasing the profits of Steam. It's just at some point VR could be bigger than Steam. Is is a, I yeah, guess the sure. things that could happen long term. We haven't really seen Steam grow out in the ways that, uh, you know, Facebook is growing out its platform, it, from a VR point of view. Your point. I, I I've been doing a lot of testing with Steam recently for like the HP Reverb, and then going between the Rift to you know uh, play some new Steam VR games and whatnot. Steam VR Home is is the worst running thing for me. <laughs> Out of all, all the various things I try on, on PC VR these days, I, it starts in a complete and utter shambles and really, really stutters the entire way through. Um, I th yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point because we, we do want to, to keep VR, at least in, in the immediate future, as this kind of three-pronged assault, right, of standalone... And then, you know, you have console as this middle ground and somehow, and then you'd lead it up to PC where, you know, we're going to be pushing the Half-Life Alexes and the, to a lesser extent, the Medal of Honors, right? And it, I think it's hard because I think we have seen some genuinely very good attempts at becoming VR, a VR publisher from some companies. It's just, it's just lots of those companies then say, okay, well, we're going to be a VR publisher and all our efforts are going into this first title and that first title just isn't able to perform uh the way they want it to to keep it moving on um but i i think is one uh, reason why for me Koch's acquisition of vertigo is so interesting because that is them signaling that you know ip that and, and franchises that are uh, pride themselves on very demanding technical performance like the metro series which is you know a very very graphically 
rich series um great at creating atmosphere great at creating you know really imaginative horrible enemy design stuff that you know i'm sure they will find a way to put on quest 2 but will really thrive on pc and console going forward that's that's what i, I kind of think we'll see going forward and I, I i hope we see more i hope we see more of ea looking at you know 15% of people, they said in, in their own stats, 15% of people played Squadrons on a VR headset. And when you consider that, Squadrons also came out on Xbox. So that's, you know, one of the free platforms it released didn't actually have VR support. I personally consider that quite a promising statistic because people identified that, you know, actually one of the best ways to experience Squadrons is with that headset on. And I think we'll see probably the same with uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator when it comes out later this month. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping, you know, next next year we will see, you know, more serious uh, acquisitions from those kinds of companies. Obviously, Ubisoft is doing two Oculus exclusives coming out. Uh, hopefully, next year maybe it might take a little longer than that. Um, but yeah, no, I I think it's a super super interesting time for acquisitions. I hope, I hope it seems definitely that we're starting to be at the turning point where you know all the doom and gloom of our reporting of the last four years maybe that's starting to go the other way now um and i think that's you know something very important to bear in mind as we go into the future ian uh before we wrap up today's uh download discussion do you have any closing comments on and on that topic or any other topics i guess i i just want to go back to the thing we talked about at the beginning regarding reshaping the real world because that's that is i think the next phase i think we are past the doom and gloom of of questioning whether vr is here to stay mm. um it was always in labs it was in labs for the last two decades so you could always find vr it wasn't like it came around in 2012 with palmer lucky and the oculus rift it was already around what changed was the consumer proposition and now 8 years later that consumer proposition is fulfilling what John Carmack described back in 2012. He described using cell phone type processors to do everything and doing it inside out. And it took, it took this long to get there. What we have next is whether we like it, <laughs> yeah. whether we like the changes that were wrought in this decade. So all these people that are concerned about privacy and security and even more amorphous like terms like freedom like the freedom to think for yourself those those things really legitimately become issues to consider when you're augmenting yourself everywhere right mm -hmm. now we're augmenting ourselves for an hour or two a day at most for most people like maybe there's one maybe there's there's people out there who are spending six hours a day in vr for work there's people who are spending it six hours a day for fun but realistically we're talking one or two hours a day maybe daily maybe a week depending on the average of the person that completely changes when it's eight hours of the day out in the real world interacting with people out on the street in public with people who have completely different views about the world and that's the future we're in for in this decade the 2020s should be defined by our social norms being upended remember you know go watch the office's first few seasons <laughs> before the iphone came out right and think about how society was different and then watch the later seasons when the, the iPhone is in everyone's pockets on, on that set. And you see the way like society changed before and after this, this technology revolution. And that's the kind of thing that I've been obsessed about for so long and why I got hooked on this technology. And it's actually going to come to pass as soon as these headsets leave our homes. So like, don't, don't give up the fight. Don't be exhausted. Find people who... <laughs> Find people who care about the things you care about and find ways to hold these companies to account. Uh, the government action we're seeing at the end of 2020 in Germany and the United States is kind of, you know, I'm curious if that's just the beginning, right? It seemed like 
suggesting that Facebook could get broken up and that Instagram and WhatsApp should be sold. Um, that's massive. That's a, that's mm. unprecedented for Facebook. I think that requ- I think that movement requires popular support to some degree to actually have an impact. And Facebook has billions of people in its user base, and that is a massive megaphone they can use to shape thought mm. if they really want it. And we need to be cognizant of that and be thinking about it and develop mechanisms that, you know, protect ourselves uh, and society, democracy, safety, privacy, those things like I hate it when people say young kids don't care about privacy the way older people do. It's just they grew up. The fact is teenagers, youngsters, they grew up with cameras in their homes. That doesn't mean they don't care about the cameras. It means they just haven't lived in a life without them. You have to explain why that matters, what's possible with the data that you're giving away. There should be models available where people pay to keep that data private. And that should be an option for, for people. If you can pay to keep your data private, you should be able to. What does that mean for people who can't pay, right? Are, are they, is that fair to them if they you know, give up? What do they give up by giving away your data? At some point, I gave Google thousands and thousands and thousands of my photos. I just said, I can't, I can't manage this anymore. I'm going to throw terabytes of photos at Google. And I, I noticed at the end of this year, Google is changing its model for Google Photos so that they're trying to push people towards paying for that storage. Because I, it's, you don't want a mismatch between your company and the tech you use and your, your personal ideals as a person. Like you want them to match up. You want uh, your data stored by a company that's ethical. And right now, uh, all of these companies are as ethical as their business allows them to be. And we need more mechanisms to kind of like make sure they actually follow through on the things that they say they're going to do. Trust me when I say I could not have said that better myself. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> That's very fantastically put. I think if you wanted a preview of uh, you know, what we're going to be thinking about as we move into the next year, um, I think that was really well put. Um, and of course, uh, we'll be having more on this kind of uh, conversation, more on this kind of topic. Uh, paired with more reveals uh, later this week. Check back tomorrow at 9 a.m. PT. We're going to have uh, an update from Resolution Games looking at Blast On and their newly announced RPG. Uh, and then we'll be talking about Arizona Sunshine a little later in the day. And then later on in the week, we're going to be looking at our most anticipated games. We've got the uh, schedule up on the on the Stevie the TV right now, If you, in case you hadn't seen it. Uh, definitely don't miss on Friday. We're going to be having our VR award nominations which we've got to figure out and fight over. Um, that'll be fun. Watch it all live. YouTube.com slash UploadVR. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll, uh, we'll see you later on in the week. Join us throughout the week for Upload VR's winter wrap-up. You can expect exclusive updates on some of 2021's most anticipated VR games. Tomorrow, our friends at Resolution Games have updates on Blast On and Demio. And on Wednesday, we'll have the first ever Quest 2 development footage of fast travel games Wraith the Oblivion Afterlife. Thursday brings season's greetings from Vertigo Games as we go behind the scenes with Unplugged and Traffic Jams. And on Friday, we'll have brand new gameplay of Sam and Max, this time it's virtual. Not only that, but we'll have more exclusives from Atlas V and others, while Team Upload wraps up the year in our virtual studio, including a look at our most anticipated games of 2021, and on Friday, our full VR award nominations. So grab a cocoa and get ready for Upload VR's winter wrap-up, starting Monday, December 14th for a week of pre-festive fun. You can catch us live on YouTube and on UploadVR.com. We'll see you then. <laughs>